today signed deployment orders to send significant additional U.S. military forces uh, to the Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf as part of Operation Desert Shield. In the days and weeks immediately ahead include the 7th Corps headquarters out of Stuttgart, Germany, the 1st Armored Division in Germany, the 3rd Armored Division in Germany, uh, the 2nd Armored Division forward, I was going through my boxes of memorabilia looking for a specific book which has some information on the Battle of the Bulge. And that would be this book right here. So I found that and then I stumbled into this map case. And I'm like, hey, this is the, uh, the map case I used when I went hunting in Wyoming and Montana. Well, upon further review, I realized that this map case had the two aeronautical charts that I used during Operation Desert Storm. So I figured what the heck I'll do a, a short video on my experience of Desert Storm just a Cliff Notes version. All the stories that I'm about to share with you have many twists and turns and we could spend a month of Sundays uh, discussing that but let's forego that for another day. At some point in time I may talk about my 2009 and uh, 10 experience in Baghdad as the senior advisor to the Iraqi oil police. Well, there you have it. Charlie Mike. I'm Corey Lesmeister, and I was the support platoon leader for the 2nd Battalion, 70th Armor of the Iron Brigade for the 1st Armor Division. Let's start this journey at Ferris Barracks, Erlangen, Germany. It was the headquarters for the 2nd Brigade of the 1st Armor Division. We shipped our tanks and other tracked vehicles by rail right before Thanksgiving and shortly after we drove the battalion's wheeled vehicles to Bremerhaven in two serials, one of which I led. I was part of the brigade's advance party. I think it was about 80 men or so. And on Christmas Eve, we flew out of Nuremberg on a Pan Am 747 with other units to Al Jubail, Saudi Arabia and stayed in a quaint tent city. It was a horrible place, and I fondly referred to it as Andersonville. On the first day of 1991, we rendezvoused with our advance party vehicles. As we were gearing up to head to Tactical Assembly Area Thompson, I was halted and questioned by the brigade commander. Following a short interrogation, Colonel Miggs intervened in our meticulously planned logistics concept. He instructed me in no uncertain terms to remain behind and await the main body. In that moment, I could empathize with Benteen's predicament under Custer's command to scout to the left. If you are well versed in Civil War history, the name Montgomery Miggs will ring a bell. Despite my admiration for him, that decision of his still irks me. As an additional note, I possess a book he authored on submarine warfare, which he gifted to Colin Powell. Somehow I managed to reunite with my battalion at Cobar Towers a few days later. Then on the morning of January 16th, the battalion command sergeant major and the executive officer who had just arrived from Thompson 
quickly issued a series of commands and ushered me into their Humvee for the journey back. During that trip, we made a stop at a rest area along Tap Line Road, only to find that the vehicle refused to start. So we left the driver to handle the situation, and the three of us resorted to hitchhiking. We made our way to El Quesuma and ultimately reached the battalion headquarters just shy of midnight. I reported to the battalion commander and immediately could sense from his demeanor that something was up. True enough, by the morning of the 17th, the air war had commenced. After staying in TAA Thompson for several weeks, our journey led us to Forward Assembly Area Garcia, where we finalized our preparations for the ground offensive. I navigated through the Saudi Arabian desert using aeronautical charts and a Loran C radio navigation system. To the best of my recollection, our entire battalion was equipped with merely three GPS devices. On G-Day, which is ground day, February 24th, we moved out for the attack. After a brief pause just short of the Iraqi border, we resumed our advance. As dusk fell and amidst a swirling cloud of dust, I was on the verge of crossing the breach in the berm into Iraq. Suddenly, emerging from the sand, stirred by hundreds of armored vehicles, an M1A1 Abrams tank barreled straight towards my Humvee. In that moment, I faced what I believed might be my end. The tank screeched to a halt so close to us that we could make out its bumper number, identifying it as belonging to one of our sister battalions, 470 Armor. The night of the 24th, we stopped for a few hours, and I grabbed an hour of sleep. And what kind of platoon was a support platoon? Well, it consisted of 16 fuel helmets, 20 cargo helmets, 6 5-ton trucks, and 2 Humvees. But the most important part of the organization was the men. These are my boys. On the 25th, we moved all day toward Al Busea. The weather went to hell late in the afternoon. That night, we made first contact with the enemy, and it was a complete Charlie Foxtrot because of the high wind and rain, which reduced visibility with the naked eye to zero. The vehicles were all mixed up, and march discipline grew impossible. This may sound hard to believe, but 25 millimeter tracer rounds from a Bradley appeared so close it was as if we could reach out of the Humvee and grab them. I will never forget one of the tank company first sergeants had to run his M113 into a defilade position and was hollering over the radio that Bradley rounds were flying over his position. So after rolling over Al Busea on the morning of the 26th, we headed straight east. During daylight, I was so sleep deprived, having only a couple hours of shut eye over the past four or five days, that I have almost no recollection of events. I snapped to that night from cold coffee, Copenhagen, and when one of my hemets accidentally smashed into the rear of my Humvee. The only damage was the destruction of the right rear fender, which made it look mean. What are you doing? Making it look mean. After that, things got interesting as we overran elements of the Adnan division. And right before noon on the 27th, we had one of our many refueling stops with my adrenaline kicking in and I was firing on all cylinders. After the short break, we had just started the advance when all hell broke loose in what became the Battle of Medina Ridge. It was the largest tank battle of the war. Oddly enough, the Battle of 73 Easting has received all of the publicity and hype. After the ceasefire, we occupied two different locations. First in Kuwait, then back into Iraq when Saddam started to suppress the Shiite uprising. The redeployment served as both a show of force and facilitated the handling of refugees fleeing the conflagration. We stayed there until early April, then moved back to Saudi Arabia, assembling just west of King Khalid military city. 
In late April, we moved back to El Cobar. I don't recall the exact redeployment date for the battalion's main body, but I think it was around the 10th of May. To sum all this up, it's hard for me to believe that 18 years later, I would return to the Middle East and get to see the inner workings of the US government at the highest levels. And before I forget, let me mention the horrific fascination I experienced meeting high-ranking members of the Badr Corps, which our intel reports said led efforts to imprison, torture, and kill enemies of the state. 33 years later, we are still engaged in the area. Someday this war is going to end. Well, let's end this on a lighter note and let me get back to the videos I was working on before this detour. Third Army, General Patton, old blood and guts. It's always interesting to see how soldiers under stress develop a sense of humor. Where are you going? Man. There's our Michigan, he's still walking. I don't know. Oh! Wipe your ass! God, I got that. I can't believe it. I was right on that. And Sarah Mitch is walking right towards there. Fire well, he hole. wants to see some dead bodies anyway. Engineers blowing things up, blowing up the bunkers. Where is he? He must be looking for a bush. I don't see anything around here. He's not looking for a tree. Yeah, that's it. I don't care who you are. That's fun you're out there. You can't laugh at that. You need to get out of here today.